Ok. Buenos días a todos. Buenas tardes. O espero que no buenas noches sean para algunos de ustedes. Pero muchas gracias por estar aquí hoy. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, we are very happy you're here. I am Eva Trujillo. Most of you know me. I was president of the HLA chapter and was president of the Academy for Eating Disorders. And with the, the current presidents of the chapters, we decided that for the first time, we were going to merge our conferences and do one virtual conference for the first time. So we are very excited about this idea. And we are very excited about the results that we expect. And thank you everyone for joining us and for joining this idea. So I want to introduce you to um, uh, the first part of our conference. Uh, I have the honor to present the three presidents of the cha AED chapters. So I'm going to read a very brief bio from each of them to, uh, to start our conference, facing the challenges of the new complexity together better and stronger. Um, so uh, the first president I want to introduce is Karin Elkazan. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist. She has a master degree in clinical and psychopathological psychology and two postgraduate degrees in clinical and psychopathological psychology from the University of, of, Sor of Sorbonne and UCU. Karin has been working as a clinical psychologist in Dubai, United Arab Emirates since 20, 2004. And she's a fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders. She's the president of the Middle Eastern chapter of the Academy and the vice president of MIRA. She oversees and runs all the association's daily operations dedicated to raising awareness, supporting sufferers, and training the general public and professionals on the subject of eating and weight disorders. Then I want to introduce Montserrat Grael. Montserrat is the president of the AIDS Hispano Latino American chapter. Eh, bienvenida, Montserrat. Bienvenidos todos del capítulo hispano latinoamericano. Montserrat is a, a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and she's the chair of the service of psychiatry at the Hospital Infal Infantil Universitario Niño Jesús in Madrid. And she's professor of psychiatry at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And lastly, but not least, I want to introduce my good friend, Humberto. Humberto is um, uh, the president of the AED European chapter. He's a clinical psychologist, fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders. He has a very extensive um, uh, bio. So I, I will just say that he is the AED uh, European chapter current president and past president of the Italian uh, Society of Eating Disorders. So having said all that, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank our presidents for uh, starting this conference and I'll give you the, the word so you can uh, start running this conference, please. Karin, if you want to start. Hello everyone and thank you for, uh, for joining us today. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to see people from all over the world gathering to uh, discuss eating disorders and I'm glad to see the Middle East part of that. Um, so um, I hope you enjoy the conference and I look forward to your questions and I look forward to a very fruitful exchange. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Adisa Myers. Thank you, Don Gannon really you know without you it wouldn't have been possible and thank you Umberto who came up with the idea uh, it's a wonderful idea and we're all very grateful for it so um, I'll see you in a second thank you Umberto you want to continue yeah thanks a lot I'm happy to be here I want to post my greetings to everybody my friends the people that chair the other chapters Together, we have to share many experiences because we have to enlarge our view. We are the academy members inside our region, but we are part of the world larger than us. And so me, I'm here to learn. Student, always. Thanks to everybody to be here. Thank you, Humberto. Montserrat, do you want to say something?
Monserrat, you're on mute. Hi. No, no, yes. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon. Yes, um, uh, it's a great pleasure for uh, to all the members of Hispanic Latin American chapter to take part in, in this conference. Uh, we have uh, an excellent panel of, of speakers in, in this new interesting and initiative no? of uh, the chapters hold a, a virtual conference. Uh, and I think this meeting is nowadays particularly important since we are assisting to a dramatic increase worldwide in incidents and clinical uh, complexity within disorders cases. Uh, only say the, the, that the Latin chapter uh, have choose uh, two speakers and two topics that provide a new ideas and, and approaches in the prevention, the PIA program from the Argentinian colleagues, and in treatment at home of adolescents uh, with eating disorders uh, from the colleagues of, uh, of uh, Madrid. I think uh, we have uh, today an understanding opportunity to share perspective, to learn from the experience of each other and, and face together this uh, challenging and new scenario of increasing of uh, complexity in the field of eating disorders. Thank you per, for the, uh, the presentations. Thank you, Montserrat. Thank you, Umberto, and thank you, Karine. And thank you everyone. So now we're ready to start and we're going to start with the opening lecture. And for that, I'm going to ask Umberto to start um, this presentation that is, um, that is about the effects from the syndemic era in Europe. Humberto, you are on mute. You're still on mute, Humberto. Let me see if I can unmute you, wait. Okay. Yes. Now you. Okay. Is the, is the organizer <laughs> they close my micro? Not me. Is the organizer, and so help me, please. Thanks. Coming back. Okay. In two thousand five, the World Health Organization introduced this commission on social determinant of health. It ends his work in two thousand eight with a book, closing the gap in a generation. World Health Organization as usual, visionary approach, because nowadays we are discussing about this that is heavy than 20 years ago. But the idea that other factors, aside from medical care, influence health was an important stepping stone to expanding understanding of biopsychosocial processes on well-being and well health outcomes. Genetics, according to Hoots and other authors, explain approximately 50% of variation in health, whereas differences in healthcare account for an estimated 10%. Healthcare contribution to health is very important, what we offer as provider, but is a part, one every four part, in the face of the health status deriving from social determinants of health. According to Marmot, is summarized in five categories, early childhood experiences, education, workplace condition, support for aging, and community resources. It appears that we have to come back to Hippocrates when he published De Aere, Equis, and Logis, introducing the correlation between environmental 
climatic cultural characteristic of the different places from the hand and the nature, custom, and the state of health for inhabitants. It's very strange because what is the reason? There's the power from the deterministic approach in medicine, virus, arrived to be uh, overlooked today by another virus, COVID-19. And Vivian Pender, the president of APA, in the editorial of The Lancet at the end of the 2021, appeal, we need to pay more attention to the context in which mental illness arise and how the environment affects health and shapes lifestyles. And so everybody are living in a very extraordinary period where pandemic accentuated the long list of pre-existing problems. Given below, transforming the world into an open hair hospital. I look at them, pandemic war, the public debt, and so the lack of funding for the services, the shortage of specialized professionals and the other aspects that you can read there. It was thought that connected world will lead the lasting peace. It was an imagination. Instead, we have never been so divided. Economy, we, finance. Oh, we can't see the slides. You can't see the slides, it's no, impossible. No, we see, we see only the first slide. So just move it on. Sorry. I move. I move in my. I move. Thanks. My moving inside my screen the slides. If you don't look at it, I don't know why. I okay. try to try to, um, to stop to stop well, the presentation to come again. back on again. Okay. To stop the presentation and to coming again there. Put it on on a slide. Yes. You can look now. Yes. This. Now we see. Now we see. Yes. And now it's changing? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. I'm saying that it was proof that connecting world would lead the lasting peace. Instead, instead, we have never been so divided. Economy, finance, information, transport, communication have integrated. Borders have been torn down. But we are living in a very hostile world where there are increasing in conflicts at all levels between individuals on social media and also in war. We live in Europe, where in the middle there's the war of Ukraine. And uh, it drives the explosion of complexity. The fragmentation of knowledge makes us incapable of grasping the irreducible complexity. Every eating disorder the clinical case is multicaused and multidimensional. The eating disorder symptom is the expression of suffering and at the same time the possible balance for the specific clinical individual history. And there's the explosion of the ambiguity. Ambiguity is the territory of the complexity that cannot be reduced to the relationship of cause and effects. In the Middle Age, Bonaventura da Bagnoregio said, scientia reddit opus pulcrum. And that this means that Intelligence, scientific approach, need creativity, faith to enlarge, to enlarge the view. Ambiguity is found everywhere. And there's a present of the opposition in the contradiction everywhere. Oxymorons such as change to be stable, control to collaborate. We need non-obvious partnership. We need contamination of demand from scientific and organizational innovation. We need multilingual professionals. In eating disorder, we take advantage, advantage of the traditional multidisciplinary approach, which, however, needs to be expanded and integrated. And contradiction. For example, in this last uh, article published by Borsarini, Papayani, and Michali some weeks ago, COVID-19 pandemic was a precipitating factor for feeling and eating disorder for many active and newly referred patients, but it had a positive impact on youth who were already in treatment and younger. And so we are facing great challenge. Help people to stay in peace with your body, your person, society, and nature. And we need to pose, first of all, to enlarge education about well-being, 
a mental illness, all patients, all parents, or family. The amount of mental illness in the world is increased rapidly after pandemic. At the beginning of the 1990, it was estimated that there was 650 million cases. But at the beginning, just before the starting of the breakdown, there were almost 1 billion, 48% more. And now the estimate is 1 billion point two. Keski Raccone reviewed the epidemiological data about Europe on eating disorder. This is the amount of people that everybody knows. But remember what is written according to Maria Angues Pelaez Fernandez, emotional intelligence and eating disorder. Deficit in emotional intelligence are linked with disorder eating and other impulsive behavior. Specific emotion such anger, fear, sadness, in addition to more and the enduring mood, affect poor responses during the ingestion process. And syndemic produce anger, fear, sadness, etc. etc. And so the increase of eating disorder is very clear in our region. Here's there the data from the Minister of Health in Italy. After six months from the breakdown, you have 40% more of new demand. It shall be a further lengthening of tense list for all mental health services, as they have experienced an increased demand with a reduction in specialist staff. And so we have to face this specific condition. More demand, less professionals, lack of funding. A effort to reduce the stigma around mental illness and eating disorder that we are working on are achieving some success. But paradoxically, this translates into an increase in demand and therefore we need to create a new generation of therapists. And so we are working to produce new therapists. About this topic, I put this information from the New England Journal of Medicine that recently, in the December 2022, published the survey on healthcare professional take individual and organizational responsibility for addressing social needs. Nearly unanimously, the people <coughs> connected consider that the every organization, health organization, should be involved in the effort to address social determinant of health. However, there is much more uncertainty as to how to address this kind of needs. We, as academy, as European chapter, I hope the other chapter need to share value and act on social determinant of health. Remembering that overwork and burned out is tremendous impact of our, on our colleague because pandemic pushed many professional at their limits. Before pandemic, 38% are working, 30% of uh, colleagues or people could not cope with demand. Now there are 46% of us that say we aren't able to face the, the question, the demand posed by the patient and their family. 38% of working much larger than before. And 45% say I'm on burnout. And remember, the general director of the WHO in October 2022 said that at least a quarter of health professionals reported anxiety, depression, and burnout simple symptoms. But we know that the effectiveness of the treatment needs professional engagement in therapy process because it's the fundamental ingredient for effectiveness. We need professional in well state and so we have to work we are working to increase the protect factors from the burnout especially offering supervision so offering training offering creativity and research 
people are so close that they are constantly confronting each other. Normally, we say that there are an increase in inequality. The increase uh, surely is because the people are more angry one against the other. Yeah, but awareness comes first, then action comes. For this reason, the fight against stigma is fundamental, like said Schneider. And so our job, spread respect in the world, in the relationship, counter the stigma. We are living in a very exciting period, and so we can be happy because we are facing very stimulative conditions. It is necessary to give life to a new tooth and an intuitive and creative tooth to, to unify art and science. And me, as said before, the starting of this conference said that I work with some artists to produce education. And we have some thread of hope. Attention on eating disorder grow, grows. For example, what will, will, should be June 2nd, there are a long list of actions that we are producing in different uh, countries of the Europe. And we participate in rebuilding system of care because, as I said before, increase of demand, lack of fund, trend, uh, lack of professionals, crisis of mental health, and crisis of organizational health system. Making earlier less expensive treatment and more effective, this is our job. Use technology, for example, Amelia, virtual reality, or what happened in the hospital of Mestre, or animating territories, developing the alliance with expert by experience and caregiver. They are the basis of the health system to care eating disorder and enlarge the network with practitioner and pediatrician to increase the early detection that can be very effective for the treatment. And the last uh, lesson that we had two days ago was exactly with the practitioner about this. This is an example that the 14th Congress, National Congress in Italy was about rebuilding health system to prevent and care eating disorder. The pandemic is causing health system around the world to rethink how they deliver care. This is the reason because The Lancet has introduced this series of webinars about rebuilding health system. And this is the same reason because New England Journal of Medicine introduced a specific issue named Catalyst that is dedicated to the rebuilding health system. And working with family and patient because they are part of the team. And so we are working to um, increase an approach to planning delivery at various levels across the health system of care and the evaluation also of the health care grounded in the history of the family, in the history, concrete history, inside the houses among eating disorder health care professionals, patients and families. And the European chapter organized seminars and training course to spread a global approach with caregiver association. And we want to increase the collaboration between the professional at the different level of care because the quality of the transition between a different care setting is important to continuity of care. That is very important ingredient for the effectiveness. But there are the barriers to successful career tra care transition. The fragmentation of care delivery. This is very heavy in many, in many parts of Europe. And so we need to share experience, to connect professionals, to connect agencies, poor communication between providers and social determinants of health, like I said before. Sharing it in this order system of care because it's too divided. Other aspect that we are working on is about the recommendation for clinical approach uh, for people L from the LGBTQI target when they have eating disorder. We are working to organize a style uh, tool to assess a, a specific approach that is in preparation and that we present. And also we are discussing about obesity. Obesity is a medical condition very frequent. It's uh, another epidemic. It is frequently observed in people with eating disorder. It often coexists. And so that's difficult to, to say if there is 
uh, all the obesity and also all the eating disorder or obesity is a part of the eating disorder because often it arrives before it's an onset of the eating disorder. Uh, often it arrives after an explosion of eating disorder. And so there are many, many overlapping one or two the other. And we are discussing a series of uh, a series of uh, webinars that we are organizing. And so summarizing what we are doing, sharing value, countering social determinant of health, prevent burnout, supporting our colleagues, fight stigma, and so increase advocacy, share education, participate in rebuilding healthcare system for eating disorder, developing alliance with caregivers and their society and their association. And so introducing family inside the setting of treatment and facilitate continuity of care from different level of care producing recommendation for LGBTQI population, reflecting the controversial point about obesity and using art as a tool, as a way to enlarge our mind. And follow us. These are the list of the tools that we have, our site, Facebook site, webinar next right treatment right patient right time and so about appropriateness appropriateness of care that it means the the crucial part of quality of care with josie geller 15 june and in the middle of september third wave psychotherapy and eating disorder with michael hazon rosenstein and uh, our newsletter and i have to thanks every time also today elisa meyer and Don Gannon. They are very supportive for us and we are here thanks also to them. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you so much. Do you want to answer questions right now or at the end? For me, it's the same as you want. Does as anybody you has a question for Umberto? There are some questions, exactly. I don't see any in the chat, but uh, if you have any question, please open open your mic and your mic, and you can ask directly to Umberto or post it in the in the chat, and I can ask him. Exactly. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Umberto. So now uh, Karin is going to present us the effects of the pandemic in the Middle East. Yes, can you hear me, everyone? Hello and welcome again. And um, I'm going to be talking from uh, the perspective of someone who has uh, been the vice president of the Middle East Eating Disorder Association for many years. And for a few years, the um, representative of the Middle East uh, for the Academy for Eating Disorders. But mainly, I'm going to be talking from the perspective of the founder and director of the only eating and weight disorders program in the region. So I'm sorry that I can speak mainly from our experience in Dubai, having to cater to uh, the pandemic in terms of eating disorders. But because of my other roles, I was able to link with other countries and have a feel of the situation as well. But mainly Dubai, UAE. So just to give you a background on eating disorders in the Middle East, uh, we know for a fact that the numbers of sufferers are very high, have surged, and, and, and possibly equate uh, the numbers of the West. However, in our part of the world, we have other issues that are more pressing to address. There is conflict, poverty, PTSD. So basically, when we speak about mental health, the focus is not on eating disorders. It is mainly on trauma, PTSD, uh, conflict resolution, uh, immigration, refugees, and eating disorders are unfortunately ignored. 
So uh, we don't have official numbers when it comes to eating disorders in the region. However, um, I just summarized a couple of surveys that have been made uh, in the recent years. For example, in the UAE, um, a telling number is that on a, on a sample of 900 girls aged 13 to 19 in Alain University, which is a big university in an emirate um, in, uh, in the UAE. So you, the UAE has seven emirates and Alain is one of them. Uh, so 1.8% of the students were found to be anorexic. And in Britain, the prevalence of eating disorders in this population is just 1%. So we can think that the rates are even higher than those of the West. And other uh, studies all over the, the Middle East have confirmed the high prevalence of eating disorders. So let's speak a bit about the pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, uh, I arrived to Dubai in, in 2004, and there is basically nothing, not only in Dubai, in the whole of the region. So we don't have till today specialized centers or residential treatment centers for eating disorders. Uh, there are no psychiatric hospitals and wards who have specialized care for eating disorders. We have very, very few professionals that are trained in the management and the treatment of eating disorders. So we're very few to be able to cater to a large number of sufferers. And uh, because of that, basically, and because of the lack of awareness of um, the first line providers, so pediatricians, possibly family doctors, um, even psychiatrists, uh, we, get, um, we get the sufferers when their, their state is already extremely, extremely bad. And, um, and what happens is that they might be hospitalized in general pediatric for the youngest or psychiatric wards and uh, often um, receive treatment by individuals, by clinicians who are not trained in eating disorders. And sometimes it causes more harm. So what we did is uh, I was uh, lucky to, to, uh, to start working in a center in 2011. It's a private outpatient mental health clinic um, in Dubai. Uh, they are actually in, uh, in four Emirates at the moment but the eating disorder program is only in Dubai for now. Um, so they supported and they understood the need for such a program and they supported me. And, and, and I was lucky also to have a wonderful team and a wonderful mentor who is with us today, Ricardo. Thank you again, always grateful. Uh, and we founded basically this eating disorder program. This is the view from my office. So you see, I'm not, <laughs> it's not too bad. Um, we, we work with uh, typical eating disorders, but also with ARFID, which Hala is going to present. And we, we really work with extremely sick patients, so extremely medically compromised and very low BMIs. And this is only possible because we have with us a family physician which uh, monitors our patients extremely closely. And I'm proud to say that our program is a CBTE Center for Excellence. <clears throat> So what happened, basically uh, patients, this is pre-COVID, patients get to us thicker, more complex, they're uneducated, they have no financial means because basically eating disorders are not covered by private insurance. The government doesn't cover the insurance of expatriates, only UAE nationals, and we have nothing, okay? And we're expected to do more with less. So they come to us extremely impaired already. So I'm not going to talk about the COVID-19 in detail in the UAE, but I'm going to say that we were pretty lucky compared to other countries because basically our total lockdown was, was short, uh, but we were in quarantine and, you know, we had limited um, uh, transportation. We couldn't move from one place to the other without having a special permit. Uh, borders were closed and, of course, no schools, extracurricular activities, all of these things. And um, a special note on Dubai and the UAE, so just for you to know, 90% of the UAE population are expatriates. And uh, most of them, most of the, the breadwinners or the providers live outside the UAE and they come for the weekend. Their families are based in the UAE and then they, they are usually in Saudi Arabia 
during the week and they come back for the weekend. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of them were basically stuck outside without their families, so, some of them for a year. So this is, a, a, I think, a specific stress for, um, for our population. I'm not going to go again, you know, everyone and, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot uh, in the eating disorder field about the perfect storm and we know social media played a huge role. And we know that the rates of eating disorders all over the world have increased three to four fold. This has been well documented. So we are not the only ones who, who suffered from that. This, is, this was a global phenomenon that was very well documented. This is one study that has been made in, uh, in Lebanon in the American University Hospital Medical Center. They have a psychiatric ward, not specialized, hopefully will be specialized soon. So uh, prior to COVID, they had one case throughout the year. And since COVID, so, so in April, from April 2020 to April 2021, so one year they had six patients versus one the year before. So this is also telling in terms of the increase of eating disorders uh, in the region. So for us, we, we experienced a fourfold increase in requests for eating disorder treatment, except for ARFID. And the majority of the new requests were for anorexia nervosa. And uh, all of them had symptoms of excessive and compulsive exercise. Everyone had started their weight loss journey and exercise journey during the quarantine uh, and mainly using workout videos. Uh, they had lost a lot of weight in a very short period of time, which led them to be very much um, more medically compromised. And they were younger. So Hala and myself, Hala, which you're going to meet soon, is a dietitian with us. We had to treat an eight-year-old girl for typical anorexia nervosa restricting type. So what do we do? Uh, so first, all of us were under stress. We don't know we're going to live, not live, what's going to happen. So providers, psychologists, psychotherapists, and dietitians are themselves under a huge amount of stress. We are trying to adjust to provide treatments online. We're, we're not very good yet. We're figuring out telehealth, <laughs> connectivity, Zoom, all of this. And we have children at home who basically you know, are, are homeschooled. So we need to help them study. And at the same time, we need to provide. And a lot of us gone, got, and one of them is me, got, <laughs> got burnt out. So what do we do? What do we do? This is, I think, the most important slide of my, uh, of my presentation. Who decides, we, we were faced with a terrible ethical dilemma. Who decides who gets treatment assessment and who waits, okay? And how do you make those decisions? On what do you base your decisions? Are you going to treat or to take the medically sickest uh, patients first, but then the rest get sicker while waiting? What about patients with atypical anorexia nervosa who are in bigger bodies, but yet, you know, medically compromised as much or if not more than those who have low BMI? And what do we do? We stop treating binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa, and we stop treating ARFID patients. So it was a very, very difficult um, time. We had many team meetings. For, of course, our waiting lists were exploding. You know, it was, it was insane. And we were trying to, with a clinical coordinator, you know, find a way to do, to do a gymnastics to be able to accommodate as many as we could, but still we had to make those decisions and it was terrible, a terrible moment for us. So we decided to treat the most medically compromised patients, the, those who were the most chronic, those who had the most comorbidities, including suicide risk, those we treated using face-to-face -face sessions because we couldn't, you know, uh, an exclusion criteria for CBTE, which we do, is the suicide the, for CBTE online is the, the suicide risk. We decided to treat also in priority the younger patients because their growth was at risk. And those who had present life stressors, so having someone infected by COVID or having been separated from their father or mother because of the lockdown. So uh, we adapted ourselves to, uh, to remote treatment. Thankfully, the treatment that we use, CBTE, is very well suited for remote delivery. Uh, you can do the whole uh, protocol online and it works uh, actually very well. Uh, so what did we do? We implemented telehealth in our clinic and we had special issues, uh, special permits 
uh, laissé passer which allowed us clinicians to be able to attend in person. Uh, we, you know, uh, we self-taught, we taught ourselves uh, remote CBT. We used um, the, the articles of the Credo Group, Ricardo helped us, and we started uh, offering self-help, guided self-help via telephone calls when we could. Actually, we worked more. We stopped working and treating other men mental health disorders as psychologists because the center is a big center and we are 16 psychologists. So the rest of the psychologists could cater to other uh, mental health problems. So we focused only on eating disorders. We started delivering guided self-help for, um, for binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa, so less sessions. And dietitians uh, started offering stage one of CBTE and then referring back to psychotherapists for stage two and three. Our dietitians are fully CBTE trained. They receive the same training as um, our psychotherapists. And they started, uh, our dietitians started uh, delivering the full CBTAR treatment for ARFID, which means we as psychologists did not have to, to use, I mean, to treat ARFID patients except when we had to intervene, for example, when there was presentations of aversive fear of eating. Today, we still face the same influx of patients. The approximate waiting list for an appointment is six months. I forgot to say that we have requests from all over the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia. Now, um, there has been uh, a training uh, for um, the American Center, um, the American University Center in Lebanon, and now they have a team and there are some members in Lebanon that have, uh, you know, joined this eating disorder CBTE training who are able to deliver um, CBTE. And of course, there are other providers in Lebanon which are able. So we don't have a lot of requests from Lebanon. We have requests more from Saudi Arabia, mainly Qatar, um, Jordan. Um, these are basically the, the, the countries that, that have the most demand. There is a team also in, uh, in Qatar now that has just started in Sidra, so also they are able to cater to more sufferers. But just to give you an idea, in the whole Middle East, this is really, you know, very, very few um, possibilities of treatment in the region. In Dubai and in the UAE, we have a couple more uh, psychotherapists. There is um, one more... Um, so it's not a team, but there is a dietitian and um, and a psychologist in maybe one or two other centers, but that's it. And all the other Emirates, there is nothing yet. So what did we gain? We learned that the CBTE was well received by all patients um, remotely and sometimes preferred. Uh, we It gave us self-confidence that we could respond to crisis. And most importantly, it allowed us to offer treatments to more sufferers who couldn't access treatment because of logistical problems. So for example, uh, sufferers in other Emirates who really have zero possibility of, uh, of, um, of seeing eating disorder therapists because they're not existent or in parts of the world or in the region, in parts of the region that uh, don't offer any type of specialized care, like I said, Saudi Arabia in the priority. And then of course, our, our dietitians delivering stage one of CBTE for of course only binge eating disorder and bulimia and CBTAR of, allowed us to cater to a bigger number of patients. And thank you very much. Thank you, Karin. Does anyone has a question for Karin? No, okay. Then I'm gonna share my screen and I'm going to present what we have in Latin America. Just give me one second. Okay, are you seeing my screen there? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Eva. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to present a, a brief overview of what we have in Latin America and the effects from this endemic. 
And I don't think it's going to be very different from when I heard from Humberto and Karim. I think that uh, we all um, were affected very much by the COVID pandemic. And um, first, I'm going to tell you some specifics about Latin America and the migration we have in our countries. There are currently 232 million migrants in the world. And after Asians, Latin Americans represent the second largest diaspora group with the majority, which is around 26 uh, to 50 million living in North America. And um, uh, over 3 million Latin Americans that live in Europe, they mostly live in, uh, in, uh, in Spain. And most Latin American migrants come from Mexico, Colombia, and the Caribbean states. And they are on average 36.7 years old. And there are few differences in the number of males and females that migrate. And in the last decade, the overall number of migrants of Latin American Caribbean origin increased by around 36%. So Latinos or Hispanics in the United States are a fast growing population that are expanding from a very small regionally concentrated group, fewer than uh, 6 million people in the 1960s to a now widely dispersed population of well more than 50 million people. And 25% of them live in poverty in the United States. So when we talk about Hispanics, I thought it was important to make the difference um, about um, Hispanics and Latinos. Hispanics refer to language and those whose ancestry comes from a country where Spanish is spoken, while Latino refers to geography, specifically to Latin America, to people from the Caribbean, from South America, and from Central America. And since 2000, the primary source of Latino population growth has swung from immigration to native birth. And Spanish is the official language spoken throughout Latin America, but not all Latinos speak Spanish. Latinos are a multiracial, multicultural group. So we include indigenous people who speak their native tongues and also the exact Spanish words may have different meanings according to the region. You should see a meeting of the HLA chapter when we, uh, we laugh a lot because we use one same word can have different meanings dependent, di different meanings dependent on the country. So even we all speak Spanish, we, we not always we put the same um, definition to the words. Um, and about the Latina women or the Latinos around food. Food is central to Latino culture and community. It is a primary symbol to maintain group solidarity and cultural identity, especially in those individuals who have experienced immigration. These experiences and cultural norms modify eating patterns. Uh, in Latin America, our family units are large with very traditional gender roles and extensive family involvement. And it is very common that in our treatment programs, we involve not only the direct family, but also the extended family. And in most Latino countries, government efforts are focused on weight control and weight loss due to the high prevalence of obesity and diabetes in Latino countries. So just as Karin said, eating disorder patients have little or no attention in our countries. And in the past decades, eating disorders have been known to occur among ethnic minority individuals and not only on the white Western individuals I thought for a long time. So the, a very particular group in risk to develop eating disorders is the Latino women with a significant risk for body dissatisfaction, disorder eating and eating behaviors, as has been stated in several publications by Becker, by Franco, by Jenkins, by Rogers. So we have had a lot of evidence about these risks in this population. Regarding the epidemiology of eating disorders in Latin America, we really don't have a 
national or multinational um, statistics, but any systematic review and meta-analysis that David Kohler and colleagues reported on the epidemiology of eating disorders in Latin America. They review the literature in English and Spanish and Portuguese, and they screen around 1,500 records and identify around 17 studies in the most important databases. So these studies, were conducted in several countries from Latin America, like Argentina, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Venezuela. And um, with this, they provide prevalence rates for at least one of the most common eating disorders that are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorders. So they they demonstrated that the prevalence rates for anorexia and nervosa in Latin America, uh, it, it was a mean point prevalence rate of 0.1%. And this was similar, similar um, it, was, it was significantly lower compared to European or North American samples. And it, it was suggested that there may be a protective factor in the Latin American culture for the development of anorexia, probably because of this um, gordi buena, which is curvy type of body, um, and, uh, that maybe we have a different body ideal in Latin America, maybe less skinny and more curvy when we compare it to the United States of, of, or to Europe. And also Perez and, and her team, they found that Latinos endorse fewer weight concerns and less dieting or exercise behaviors, not only in Latin America, but also when comparing Latino samples within the United States with non-Hispanic white peers. And regarding bulimia, they calculated a mean, a mean point prevalence similar to Western nations. It was around 1.16. And regarding binge eating disorder, the mean point prevalence was 3.5%, which was very high compared to studies from Western nations and, and what was expected. And they identified two potential factors for this. One is because food has a high emotional value in our in our culture. And uh, we have a higher prevalence rates of obesity and overweight in Latino countries. And regarding our feed, uh, we don't have any epidemiological studies, but my group uh, published a series of 24 cases and we reported in Mexico. Um, uh, the, we confirmed the existence of a cohort of patients with ARFID in Latin America. And we suggest that ARFID, it's not a culture bound syndrome. What about research? Research in Latin America is very scarce. Most of the literature is in Spanish or Portuguese language in, in journals in, in Spanish or Portuguese. And this decreases considerably the international visibility of Latin America. The most common themes for research are epidemiology, risk factors, instrument validation, and most research is based in community samples, mainly university samples and surveys, mostly cross-sectional studies and case reports. We had few or not non-clinical trials, and as Umberto said, funding is almost inexistent in our countries. So before pandemic, the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean had made great efforts in, in, in the last decades to increase the adequate coverage of their health services. However, significant inequalities persist both between and within countries. And the gap between urban and rural rural areas is the most significant inequity in this region. However, unlikely most of the public health problems in Latin America, COVID-19 has affected urban areas above all, especially those where poverty is concentrated. So at first, when the pandemic started and we start hearing about it in Europe, uh, it was believed that compared to high income countries, Latin America would be more protected from COVID-19 thanks to its greater geographical dispersion and the relative use of its population. 
However, after accounting for the population age difference, the infection fatality rates were worse in Latin America and in low and middle income countries compared with higher income European nations. In reality, it has been one of the regions most vulnerable to the pandemic due to regional disparities in health capacities, weak health authority, and structural and historical inequalities that shape the social determinants of health. Um, managing the pandemic has been an eminently urban challenge, which has substantially affected the most marginalized districts of the cities and the municipalities with the highest population density. And in these areas, the COVID-19 crisis has predominantly affected the poorest groups due to the size of the informal labor market, the barriers to accessing the health services, and of course, malnutrition. So the role of health system has been fundamental, but the structural determinants place the region in a social historical position of vulnerability, especially in the large metropolitan, metropolitan areas. So what happened? What was the timeline? In Mexico, the first case was detected in February 28, 2020, but it was until the end of March that the health emergency was declared. And at the end, Mexico was the fourth country with the most death globally and the third in America after the, the United States and Brazil. And also the, the vaccine accessibility was delayed, having acceleration until mid-2021. And even today, countries like IT have only a total, a list, uh, and not, not more than 1% of total coverage. So we still have countries in Latin America that has a non-existent coverage with the vaccine. So, as Karin said and Umberto said, it happened to us too. The pandemic forced us to an abrupt change in how we deliver treatment and clinical services and the eating disorder field was not an exception. Several strategies were implemented to provide a better access to clinical services. And during the pandemic, uh, there was no conclusive evidence on how confinement affected children and adolescents. Um, before the pandemic, Latin America already had major psychological, psychosocial needs that went unmet and expressed themselves in mental problems, difficulties, and disorders that could be readily traced to deep social inequalities, as I said, and the markedly limited economic capacity from governments to address their respective situations. The pandemic, which started as a disease among the more affluent classes that travel overseas, mostly by planes, or who had family living overseas and came back to visit, affected the most vulnerable population, those who live in precarious, crowded quarters without access to sanitary resources, unable to engage in social distances, distance, labor in direct service delivery, and rely on public health care services. So the most recent studies have documented and made patent effects on the various vulnerable populations, such as migrants, women, children, the elderly, people living with significant disabilities, people experiencing smart housing and food insecurity, people who had previous mental health problems, temporary workers laboring in what has been referred to as the informal economy. And the pandemic has affected the public mental health and well-being in various ways, including th through isolation and loneliness, job loss and financial instability and illness and grief. Um, through the pandemic, many adults reported symptoms, symptoms consistent with anxiety and depression with approximately four in 10 adults reporting these symptoms by early 2021 and before declining to approximately three in 10 adults as the pandemic continued. Additionally, drug overdose deaths have sharply increased, mainly due to fentanyl, and after a brief period of a decline, suicide deaths are once again on the rise. Here in Mexico, we have a very, very serious increase in drug overdose, and we are, we are starting to see overdosing with fentanyl, 
and the suicide death in adolescents and young adults has rise sharply. And these adverse mental health and substance use outcomes have disproportionately affected some populations, particularly youth. And even with the end of the declaration of the public health emergency on May 11, 2023, many people continue to grapple with words and mental health and well being and face barriers to care. So there was a study carried out in seven Latin American countries, Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Mexico, Paraguay, and Uruguay, with a, a sample of 4,800 uh, 4, individuals, and they found that only 31 0.4% of the total participants did not present symptoms of anxiety. So 60%, 70% of them had some, some uh, degree of anxiety. And regarding depressive symptoms, almost less than half of the sample uh, did not have symptoms of depression, but more than half, 60% of the sample presented some kind of degree of depression. And the fear of COVID significantly and positively predicted both anxiety and depression, significantly impacted anxiety more than depression. And the study's findings supported the conclusion that as people get older, they are, they are less afraid of COVID, anxiety, and depression. Women were on average, more afraid of COVID-19 and depression, but, but exhibit the same level of anxiety as men. So the effect that COVID-19 has had on our patients with eating disorders is still not completely known. We believe that our patients with anorex, uh, with our patients uh, due to their physical characteristics, particularly with anorexia nervosa, were more vulnerable to medical consequences with the COVID infection. We know for sure that adverse emotional and social effects of confinement were very deleterious and we are still seeing most of its effects combined now with cases of long COVID. Uh, several studies reported an increase in the eating disorder symptoms during the pandemic. A group of patients that uh, Montserrat and her group reported, uh, they found that 40, 41.9% of these patients in Spain uh, reported a reactivation of eating disorder symptoms during confinement, especially eating restriction, ex excessive exercising, and worries and fear of gaining weight, in addition to increased emotional symptoms. And Brian, Brandley and Talbot, uh, they carried out a study of 100, uh, 130 participants um, that they surveyed through social networks and they were aged between 16 and 65 years old. And they obtained results that 86.7% of the participants experienced an exacerbation of the symptoms. Um, so in adolescents, especially with anorexia, the lack of routine, lack of social contact, the fears of COVID-19 infection, the duration of restrictions may have uh, an, a negative impact and present symptoms of anxiety and, def and depression. Fear of low personal control can trigger and increase in behaviors of weight control. And similarly, in another group, by spending more time at home, they have a lack of social comparison and better supervision from parents. So we had all these uh, different outcomes during the pandemic. And to be honest, and that's why I put it there, we did what we could with what we had. During pandemic, different populations at higher risk were identified from a medical point of view, such as the elderly, the immunocompromised, patients with pre-existing conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, and of course, eating disorders. And there were uh, situations of vulnerability that do not correspond to strictly medical issues, nor are they fully explained economically, but they are certainly connected, were also affected. And I referred with this to the millions of migrants and forcibly displaced populations, indigenous populations, women victims, survivors of multiple sources of violence, abuse, the narco, exposed children and adolescents, the incarcerated and the institutionalized people in hospice and nursing homes, homeless, temporary workers, laboring in what is referred to as the gig economy, 
gender and sexual minoritized populations, people living with mental illnesses, and other forms of, of disabilities. So um, to, to increase all these, the difficulties to deliver treatment face-to-face -face force most of us to change to the teletherapy in most programs, just as uh, Karina and Umberto said. But in most Latino countries, more than 50% of the population does not have regular internet access, and there is less acceptance of a non-face-to-face non -face intervention for mental health problems. And as uh, uh, Thomas and other uh, other authors reported in the International Journal of Eating Disorders, there were also other stressors that put our patients with worse symptoms, like the headline stress disorder, the extensive social media and media outlets coverage on possible risk, body image, tips to stay healthy and thin, and of course the uncertainty we were all living during that those those years. Um, regarding food insecurity, COVID-19 and eating disorders, food volume and variety was restricted due to the economical issues. At some point during the pandemic, you could not go to the supermarket and buy your regular uh, supermarket. You were, you were um, assigned uh, specific quantities and there were more economical, the more economical constraints, less access to food. And also there was people with feelings of guilt due to food insecurity in the community and also the need to eat more in low weight individuals. And, and food insecurity has been associated with greater frequency of binge eating, compensatory behaviors and increased concern of weight and shape. And people with food insecurity are more likely to have diagnosis of bulimia. So Kara Christensen and Kelsey Forbush and colleagues evaluated the impact of COVID-19 and food insecurity in a university sample. And they found that students with food insecurity reported greater ED-related impairment, so more frequent objective binge eating and more frequent compensatory fasting relative to students without food insecurity. And the students with food insecurity had a higher prevalence of any probable eating disorder diagnosis than those without food insecurity. So students with and without food insecurity did not differ on frequency of purging behaviors or excessive exercise. And just as, as Kara and Kelsey described in that study, that's what we saw in the clinical area in, in Latin America. So food insecurity increased increased very much during the pandemic, all this eating disorder, patho eating pathology. And another problem we, we had here is because of the lack of, of good internet in many regions in Latin America, uh, most school closed. So people was having, uh, children was having uh, either one hour a day or none at all of a school for almost two years. So that uh, that was a very big impact in the education in our countries. And the United Nations Children's Fund estimates that for nearly a year, more than 168 million children were out of school because of pandemic, but two thirds of them were in countries in Latin America. And this this was, this, this affects, this, uh, um, this impacted very, very much the education in our countries. And, and we're expecting to see this impact, this negative impact in the coming years. Other issues, um, um, and, and I think that is one very important lesson from the pandemic is that we as professionals should push, put pressure on medical schools, on universities, to urgently improve evidence-based science and then statistics education, not only because of the dangerous misinformation regarding early treatment for COVID-19 in Latin America that was widespread by individuals with large communication platforms and economic conflicts of interest, but also 
because we need training in early diagnosis and timely intervention for eating disorders. Unfortunately, a large portion of the health community broadly adopted clinical practices that were not based on evidence, unveiling these practitioners' poor scientific backgrounds. And medical and other health sciences schools must be made aware of the importance of well-designed studies, notions of probability and behavioral biases in clinical practice. And also we need to uh, find ways to develop scalability of mental health care services in our countries. Um, we, we have, uh, we, we, as, as Karin said, uh, we, we are not, um, we are not enough professionals for all the people we have to reach out. So we need to uh, uh, find a way to, to scalabilize these uh, programs and these treatments. Um, so COVID-19 represented a very serious threat to Latin America, mainly because it confronts the region with underlying and unresolved problems, specifically social inequality, expressing in inequities of access to healthcare, living arrangement, and financial resources, among others, played a crucial role in the ultimate impact of public health in the region, not only in terms of people's physical and mental health, but also regarding the excessive burden of psychosocial stress on communities and governments. And also the findings that individuals with food insecurity are at a higher risk for eating disorders highlights the importance of providing eating disorder screening for students who access these resources so that they can be referred to treatment on time. It, it is crucial that the empirical evidence contributes to the design of public mental health policies in Latin America, both to lessen the negative effects of this endemic and to prevent the future consequences of a pandemic that was declared ended, but we are still seeing its effects. It is also important to recover the psychological and community programs that have been implemented during the pandemic, be they face-to-face -face or virtual, to extract those experiences that can be beneficial in the mental health care of the Latin American populations and that can serve as guidance for future, future actions, in particular to address the needs of the most vulnerable populations. And it seems fair to say that there had been sizable efforts worldwide to coordinate and advance global and mental health. Although imperfect, they had served as a guide. However, it is conditioned by visions and concerns from other contexts that are not easily translated or applied to our region. So we need to develop policies and clinical guidelines on the most relevant psychosocial problems surrounding eating disorders to guide scientific research public policy planning and the professional response that will need to be assigned to and relied upon each region. And finally, I want to invite you to participate in the Eating Disorders Genetic Initiative Mexico. So if you are in Latin America and you're listening to me, please uh, scan this QR and answer our survey. And if you are elected, you will be contacted. And we need a lot of controls and a lot of uh, uh, patients. So please uh, pass it to your contacts. And finally, as Humberto said, I want to invite you. I'm the chair for the uh, uh, World Eating Disorders Action Day this June the 2nd. And our theme for this year is real people, real recovery. Those are all the, the social media uh, addresses. So please follow us, uh, give us likes and share everything we are putting and we are posting on social media so we can spread the word around the world. We are now around 1000 activists and around 250 organizations from 60 countries. So. Muchas gracias. That's my team. Gracias a mi equipo. And those are our social media. So thank you. Thanks a lot for your very wonderful presentation. So I don't know if anyone has a question for me. And some idea to face so great social determinant 
what do you think to face it? I think we need to work as one. Uh, I think we need to uh, to 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 work like we have been working in the academy all together and being just one because we as as you saw in the three presentations we presented mainly the same problems. So we need to train professionals. We we need to. Um, to confront some social determinants of health. And we need to, uh, money is an issue everywhere. And uh, so if we if we are stopped by that, we need to find what can we do with what we, 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 with what we have. So if, um, if, we, if we can work all together in our countries, and develop things that we can share to other people. I think that is the first step to start advancing the social inequality we have in the world. Ava, I believe Elizabeth Marino has a question. Please, Elizabeth. Yes, my question was um, related to what you were talking previously. Um, so what do you think that has to be addressed uh, in order to help people in vulnerable, in vulnerable situations and that might be experiencing an eating disorder in Latin America? Oops. <laughs> there are so many things we need to do, but if we don't start, we will never do it. So we need to start with what we have, whatever we are. Uh, I think it's, um, it's imperative that we we can get, we can give access to care, at least uh, uh, the basic uh, care to all these patients. And one form to do it is to go to universities. That's what I had been doing in Latin America. Go to universities and start training people from health sciences so they can help us to be the, uh, the, the, the first contact and help us to identify early identification and timely intervention for these patients and families. And um, um, that is a lot of work and we need everyone to do it and we need education everywhere. So I think that is uh, one of the first steps we could do. So thank you. Thank 